Hello and welcome to Digital Marketing Musings, hosted by Merkle. Each episode, we choose a different expert to share the latest and greatest in digital marketing trends. Today, we're interviewing Chloe Hutchison and Ellie Hearn about digital PR. Okay, let's get to it. I'm Gaia Reed. And I'm Andrea McCartney. And this is Digital Marketing Musings. Thanks for tuning in to Digital Marketing Musings. Today, we're joined by Chloe Hutchinson and Ellie Hearn to talk about digital PR. Chloe Hutchinson is a digital PR and content director at Dunsu International. She's taken a leading role in innovating and evolving the audit and strategy process for digital PR, ensuring the right tactics are proposed to each client to help drive SEO success. Ellie Hearn is a digital PR manager at Dentsu as well. She has a keen interest in exploring and developing new and innovative outreach strategies and using her learnings to inform future campaign development. She's now shaping digital PR processes more broadly at Dentsu as an outreach manager. Welcome to our show, Chloe and Ellie. Thank you for having us. Hi. So the burning topic of the day, what is digital PR? Okay, so I'm going to start this off with saying that digital PR has been known as a few things over the years. It's kind of been constantly evolving to what it is today. Um, So you might have heard the term content marketing um, and it's evolved from that. Um, Basically, it's the act of encouraging earned online coverage and then most importantly, links from that coverage from authoritative and relevant websites um, to your brand's website. And that will help to drive SEO value. So we're creating media friendly stories that have related content on site that can be linked back to. This is tying in a lot to our our show with uh, Adam and Eric a few episodes ago, and this is definitely where the uh, the genesis of this episode came from. So can you go into a little bit of details about what the difference between PR and digital PR is? Because they seem quite similar. Of course. Um, So both Ellie and I have actually been in um, both sides of PR. Um, so we both know them very well um, and essentially they have different goals and objectives so traditional PR tends to focus on the brand awareness landing brand mentions and all those key brand messages whereas digital PR sits more under the realm of SEO and is all about landing coverage of stories which secure those all important links to help boost search rankings and improve the overall backlink profile but I'm going to pass on to Ellie um, who's going to go into it a little bit more Yeah, so as Chloe said, um, we've both worked in traditional and digital PR. I much prefer digital PR, just on a personal (laughs) level. Um, But I'd say that traditional PR has sort of a wider scope in terms of channels. So you might see um, traditional PR efforts on TV, print, radio, whereas digital PR focuses purely on online channels. It doesn't mean that it doesn't extend outwards. Um, I worked on a campaign which was mentioned on daytime TV and another one which was about dangerous drivers in South Africa, which actually prompted a 40 minute long debate on a South African radio show, which was quite interesting to listen to. Um, but those aren't sort of the primary wow. objectives of the work. Yeah, <laughs> it was quite funny. The client <laughs> luckily really enjoyed it and thought it was funny rather than worrying about it. Um, But yeah, one of the biggest differences is that PR is very closely tied to the product, service or brand, whereas digital PR is a sort of a step removed. So, for example, I worked on a brand that was curtains and the traditional PR with this would focus on the actual curtains and the product, whereas the digital PR campaigns could extend out, sort of sit in the same realm, but talk about maybe the home in more general terms. Um, So, yeah, that's another difference. Mm. Got it. Okay. And to someone just hearing about digital PR for the first time, why is it really important to a client or advertiser? So digital PR is all about actually building those links. So it's very, it's very close to link building. Um, so list, uh, we did listen to um, Eric and Adam's episode, um, which was fab <laughs> as well. Um, and they did, they did cover um, quite a bit about digital PR in there as well. Um, but it's about acquiring those authoritative and relevant links. Um, Now, links have always been at the top of the pyramid, should we say, when it comes to an SEO strategy. So you always need that strong technical foundation and the content base, and then links are the top of the pyramid. So where technical and content um, form the foundation and help your website to rank for specific keywords, digital PR 
or link building helps you to rank higher. Um, and whilst um, Google has said that they can't put a number to the number of ranking factors, and I think it might have been Adam that potentially said there are thousands um, on your yeah. last podcast. Yeah. <laughs> um, it is known that links and referring domains are one of the top ranking factors. And there are a number of studies. So there was one back in 2020 by Backlinko and they analyzed, I think it was almost 12 million Google search results to look at what correlates with those um, pages, which rank in those top traffic driving positions. So that's positions one, two, and three. Um, and the number of backlinks and the number of unique websites or new referring domains that link to those pages were higher than those that ranked further down page one. So that's why digital PR is so important because it is the most effective way to drive the right types of links to get you up up the top of Google search results so that more people click on you basically. Got it. And compared to um, maybe traditional PR, which you mentioned was more focused on like brand awareness. How do you obtain and measure success in digital PR? So I would say the ultimate objective of digital PR is to improve SEO. Um, so you need to use SEO metrics to monitor those successes. The factors which I found uh, to have the most profound effect for clients have been obtaining authoritative, relevant and high DA follow links. So for someone then that, long oh, sorry, for someone that doesn't know what sorry. DA stands for, can you uh, fill that in for us? Yeah. So domain authority is a sort of metric that was created by Moz, which are huge in the SEO space. And it basically sort of decides where your, well, it kind of indicates where your content might rank on Google searches. Perfect. Sorry no for getting in there. <laughs> no, sorry, Andrea. <laughs> Didn't mean to say that at all. Um, and then, so then long term, that those um, metrics then have their long term benefits too. So um, we're looking at search rankings and new keywords that are ranking for the brand and then overall search visibility, which are like the key objectives of digital PR activity in the long run. Um, but we can also measure things like um, on site objectives, so like uh, organic um, traffic um, that's come through organic search, um, any referral traffic, um, and then additionally you can look at business objectives too. So you can look at things like assisted conversions, which obviously sets us apart from traditional PR, where it's it's harder to measure those business objectives through traditional PR tactics. Right. Perfect. So I know we've talked a lot about just digital PR in general at the moment, but who is it really right for? Is it right for everyone? Are there certain brands or clients that are better suited for it? What are your thoughts on that? I would say that it is right for anyone in any industry. Um, I've worked across so many different brands, like kids' toys, cars, healthcare, <laughs> like vitamins, like absolutely everything you can imagine. I think the difference is the amount of digital PR activity um, that will depend on the brand, the budget and competitor activity. So for example, I've personally found that in the beauty um, sort of industry, reactive campaigns don't do so well, but big data heavy campaigns do. Whereas for something like car insurance, their reactive stuff's really good because there's often new news coming out and that can work really well. So I think it's definitely for everyone. I think it just depends on um, sort of the facts that I mentioned, like brand budget and competitor activity. I don't know if Chloe's got anything to add there. Thanks, Billy. Um, so the only other difference will be if they have an e-com function on site. So there are obviously certain brands. So we previously um, pitched for a, a toothpaste brand, um, but obviously they don't have that purchase function on site. So when it comes to targeting, it's very different. They wouldn't mind the retailers who stock them and where consumers would purchase for them to rank higher than they do for those high intent keywords. So keywords that people search when they're looking to buy something, for instance. But then the site, the brand website would still want to rank for, say, those more informational keywords when people are looking into different products. So it would be a different part of that consumer journey that they were looking to target. OK, perfect. And then Ellie, I know you had mentioned a reactive campaign versus a data heavy campaign. Can you give me like an example of each just to make it a little more tangible for, for both me and, and our listeners? Yeah, definitely. So reactive 
is sort of defined as reacting to something in the news. So a really great example is a brand in the UK, Harry Styles wore a purple feather boa <laughs> and a fashion brand um, sort of put a story out about the, how their sales had gone up. I think it was by like 450% oh, wow. after he okay. wore the feather boa. So that was a really short, easy to turn around, super quick, low effort um, sort of campaign that can be sent out really quickly. But the difference is it has a very limited outreach window. So Perfect. obviously, if you would send that out now, journalists wouldn't be interested because they'd say, well, those awards were last year and that was an interesting story last year, but not now. Whereas a sort of larger data heavy, we call them hero campaigns. Um, and they have a lot of different metrics, a lot of different data sources. They'll have sort of design, development, research time. They'll sit on site. They might have an interactive element and they're just a lot more effort, but they do have a much longer outreach window. Got so it. those are the main differences, really. Perfect. And then last question before I turn it back over to Gaia, uh, why should brands go into digital PRs instead of link building? So I would say the difference between link builders and digital PRs is that link builders are just set on one goal of acquiring links. Um, whereas digital PRs will kind of look at the whole strategy, take a more holistic approach and create content that's going to really impress people and naturally create a buzz, which will improve the rankings. Also taking into consideration um, what the SEO team's doing, what the brand team's doing, it's kind of a more wide reaching approach. Um, and then also, um, as Eric and Adam mentioned in their episode, link builders are often associated with spammy and bought links, whereas digital <laughs> PRs are known yep. for earning the links, which is um, best practice. <laughs> no shady back alleyway tactics going on yep. with digital PRs. <laughs> yeah, no black hat SEO, <laughs> just white hat. Yep. Fair enough. Thank you. So digital PR seems to be a term that's at least pretty new to me. Um, how do you see the future of digital PR continuing to develop um, as either like a standalone channel or a role investment for different brands or, or agencies over, over the coming years? So digital PR, um, yeah, it has, evolved, it has evolved quite a bit over the last few years um, and it's, it is currently booming. Um, I think that it always delivers the best results when we're working really closely with an SEO team because then we can, as we are um, focused on the SEO results, we want to make sure that our strategy aligns to their strategy and what their focuses are for the year. Um, so ensuring that we're that one team to working towards that same goal um, is really key. So we always we foresee that the investment in digital PR will continue to grow with SEO. Um, and we can see that across the industry as well, that um, there are smaller SEO agencies who are trying to build out the digital PR offerings um, and also um, a number of um, big brands that have uh, put in briefs to pitch they are specifically requesting digital PR as well as part of their SEO um, brief, um, which is very exciting um, seeing that start to come through. Um, but I think Ellie might have some more to add on that. Yeah, so I think the future of digital PR is something that I'm really, really excited about. As Chloe said, it's so changeable. Um, I mean, Google could release an update tomorrow that would sort of nullify what we're doing. They won't, but you know, in theory that could happen. <laughs> And so it's sort of an industry where you always have to be looking ahead. Um, it's not stagnant at all. It's like so fun because what we were doing two or three years ago would probably wouldn't work now. But the things that we're doing now are really new and exciting. Um, I think the main thing is that digital PR needs to work with other channels as well. It can't just be an, a sort of a standalone thing, as Chloe mentioned. It needs to work with SEO and other channels. Um, so yeah, I think that's the future. And Chloe, it sounds like we're seeing a, a boom in demand, at least a, a Dentsu um, for digital PR services. Yes, we are definitely seeing a boom in demand. I think um, I've been at Dentsu for coming up to four years now. And when I first started our outreach team, as we were called back then, was only three people. Um, and we have more than tripled in size in the last three years, which is really exciting. Um, and as mentioned, like the briefs are coming in with digital PR now, which they never did before. We we obviously positioned it as part of our SEO offering, but seeing that come in now is, um, is really exciting for the industry. Um, and there, there's definitely a lot of buzz, I guess, everywhere as um, more brands are wanting to actually um, have digital PR um, on their, in their marketing mix. 
Uh, so as we're wrapping up our episode here, what are some specific strategies um, that we can recommend for our clients or that they should take away from this episode? I would say that before we recommend a strategy to a client, the first um, and most really important thing to do is to conduct an audit. So look at what your search competitors are doing. Um, it's also important to note that search competitors are often different to um, the business's usual competitors. So for example, a department store might compete against other department stores, but if you're trying to build links to maybe a swimsuit page, you should be looking at what swimsuit brands are doing rather than department store brands. I think Ellie knows that I can talk about audits for days and I promise I won't, but <laughs> um, <laughs> auditing is, is kind of, I, I absolutely love auditing because it really does not cover exactly what you need to help that brand succeed. So I think that Adam and Eric outlined in their episode about these link gaps um, and auditing is all about uncovering those. So the link gaps, so where your competitors are getting these really valuable links that you haven't quite got yet. Um, but also considering this alongside the keyword research. That's why we work so closely with the SEO team. So understanding what those keyword opportunities are and which keywords we want to be improving and then using both of those to create the strategy and tailoring the strategy to how we can capitalize on those opportunities but also close those link gaps as well um and there are some other things that you need to consider within strategies and ellie's gonna um jump back in i think yeah so we also need to consider budget so what realistically can be achieved with the budget on hand we need to think about what impact we want the work to have so if we're defending a high position then a smaller piece might be better use of that budget but if we're looking to climb up the ranking significantly then we're going to need a much bigger piece um, so a really good example of that is the body shop we operate in different markets and we've tailored our strategy for them so the uk is a really really competitive space so we have a lot of activity we do um much more hero campaigns, more sort of editorial reactive as well. Um, and then we also need to be um, looking at Canada. So in Canada, competitors are doing much less activity. So we're able to do less activity, but remain competitive in that space. Um, and then the last thing you need to consider is the media appetite. So especially um, looking at sort of uh, brands which are across different markets, we found that campaigns which land in the UK often fall completely flat in other markets. Um, and the research, the sort of feedback we get is quite damning. And whereas in the UK, journalists might love it. In the US, journalists will kind of go, this is so stupid and we hate it. So I think you need to really consider like who your like, target market is. And also in different sectors as well, that's quite true. So sort of you can be more jokey with a football story, but if you're gonna hit finance journalists, you need to be quite serious because it's just sort of, that industry and that's how sort of people communicate there. So yeah, I think to sum up really, the most important thing is to consider the findings from your audit, the market, and also the budget that you've got available. Fantastic. Well, thank you, Chloe and Ellie, again, for joining us and sharing your expertise on digital PR. We really do appreciate it. Thank you for having us. Thanks so much for having us. That brings us to the end of this episode of Digital Marketing Musings. If you have an idea for a future episode, we'd love to hear it. Just drop us a note at digitalmarketingmusings at merkelink.com. And don't forget to subscribe as well as rate and review us. It helps others find our show. And please be sure to tell a friend. Until next time, I'm Andrea McCartney. And I'm Gaia Reed. Bye.